So welcome everyone. This is the second session of the Fiat Free Twitter Space, co-hosted by Trezor. And tonight we are going to discuss the situation in Lebanon uh, with a dear guest, my favorite Twitter account, Thomas. And Thomas, uh, per his Twitter bio, is a certified enlightened Bitcoiner, digital nomad, minimalist, citadel maximalist, with heavy interest in sound economics and individual sovereignty. But uh, before we get into it, I would like to cover some organizational matters. Uh, this space is recorded and will be published later on the Trezor YouTube channel as well as uh, other podcasting platforms. And we'll initially have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Tomas for about 30 minutes. Uh, so, but you will have a chance to join in later after, let's say, these 20-30 minutes. So feel free to raise your hand throughout the discussion and we'll give you an opportunity to join in. Uh, uh, if you don't want your voice recorded, uh, just comment on the twi Trezor Twitter space uh, tweet and I will raise your question for you. That's it for the organizational matters. And now let's get into it. So, Thomas, uh, first of all, I would like to ex ask you if you could explain uh, basically your Twitter bio, where you, where you say you are a digital nomad minimalist and citadel maximalist. What does it actually mean? Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for, uh, for doing this and for showing interest in uh, this specific subject. Uh, regarding my, uh, my, my bio, it's like, Mostly it's like a meme, but uh, if, I want, if I want to I try to explain it, uh, you know, digital nomad mi minimalist, which means like because I, I work online and because I use the currency of the internet, which is Bitcoin. Uh, so this is how I am a digital nomad. And I'm a minimalist because I'm just a blab, you know, I'm just stacking sats and, uh, you know, trying to get by, staying humble, you know, as, as they say. And uh, Citadel Maximalist, I do all of this, you know, stacking sats and whatever to uh, reach the Citadel, which is representation of freedom. And uh, everyone already knows this meme. And I'm a maximalist, I'm a freedom maximalist, a bit more maximalist and all of this uh, good stuff. So, And yes, it's, it's also like the digital nomad thing. It's like a reference to the book, the individual, the, the sovereign individual. Uh, which basically means that we're all at some point we're going to be like digital citizens. So, yeah, individual sovereignty and uh, the age of uh, digital age—they all, you know, go together. All right, good. Thanks for that. So let me um, start the proper discussion on Lebanon by citing some stats because not everybody is probably familiar with the situation there uh, and you can add up to uh, what I'm going to say uh, uh, after that. So uh, the inflation rate is roughly 200% right now, which means that prices triple in 12 months and the inflation rate is increasing. Uh, so it's basically the territory of hyperinflation right now in Lebanon. Uh, and that is after almost 30 years of uh, generally like 2 or 3% inflation. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, GDP fell by about 30% in the space of one year and keeps on falling. Uh, so almost a third of uh, the economic output has been uh, wiped away. Uh, in one year. 20% uh, of GDP in Lebanon are remittance payments, which is quite similar to Salvador. Uh, the state of Lebanon defaulted on its dollar debt in 2020. Uh, some organizations call this crisis the worst one since 1850. And usually we see such crises uh, associated with some kind of conflict or, or war, but there is nothing like that going on in Lebanon. It's a, uh, it's a country that uh, has been uh, out of any kind of conflict uh, since 1990, if I'm not mistaken. And probably the underlying cause of these problems is that... Uh, the Lebanese pound or Lebanese lira has been pegged to US dollar, uh, 
uh, for about 30 years uh, at some particular rate. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it was basically like a state-sanctioned Ponzi scheme because uh, to attract the dollar deposits, uh, banks offered 15% interest rates uh, and this interest rate was paid for via new deposits. So it was just a Ponzi scheme. And this scheme collapsed in 2019. And that is when the crisis started. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Lebanese pound USD rate. It used to be uh, 1500 Lebanese pounds for $1. And right now it's uh, 32,000. So that's a pretty big devaluation. It's basically a currency collapse and it's rising fast. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, uh, Thomas? Or would you like to comment on the underlying causes of this crisis? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. That summarizes it. And you know, the causes are, maybe we'll, uh, we will discuss them uh, while we speak about while we speak about other topics, but uh, you know, basically, as you said, the, the collapse of 2019 happened because of the you know the, the Ponzi scheme, and when uh, people tried to go and get their money from the bank, simply the bank stopped giving them dollars. So this caused a, a bank run, which was counterproductive because if one bank doesn't give you your money, uh, the other customer is going to be worried about his money as well. So he he will go there and try to get his money as well. This will cause a bank run. But the, the main issue is, uh, or where the real inflation started happening, is when uh, all these dollar deposits uh, were converted to Lebanese pounds. So let's say you had uh, $10,000. The, the central bank uh, took a decision is that uh, all these deposits will be uh, you know, converted to not all of them, at least a certain percentage, would be uh, converted to Lebanese pound at the rate of 3,900, so $1 for 3,900. And basically, this money was printed out of, literally printed out of thin air. Like, if you had $10,000 in the bank, they would give you, or $1,000, they would give you 3,900,000 Lebanese lira, let's say. So... They were just simply printing this money instead of giving you your actual dollars, which uh, most of it did not exist. So this, when when they took this this, this decision in 2020, uh, this is when the rate started to rise, and now they even increased the rate of the how much of, of these deposits for like 8,000 lira, if I'm not mistaken. So after they took that decision, which was made in uh, late 2021. The rate, uh, you know, took off even more from like fifteen thousand to now thirty thousand, thirty thirty one thousand, something like that. So uh, yeah, so it's all it's all uh, wrong decisions made by the central bank, and you know this is how this is how the Lebanese pound collapsed, uh, at least in the final stages of it. I see. So the banking sector basically defaulted on the deposits because they didn't return or they didn't allow the depositors to take out their money basically in Correct. the form of dollars Correct. but yeah they just created uh, this, <laughs> this fiat currency all right uh so i i wasn't aware of that so and you are like lebanese cannot access their dollars in their banks anymore it's just all converted into uh, liras is that right right um I think they're right now they're giving it giving some part of it in dollars now, but not sure what's the percentage because you know I don't own any money in the bank. So they, I think now they made a new formula where you can get a, a certain percentage at the rate of eight thousand and a certain percentage for dollars. So they started to give uh, people more dollars uh, now, but still they're printing money to give the other percentage in Lebanese lira. And uh, mm -hmm. the point of doing this, uh, I believe, was to, uh, you know, try to uh, let the collapse or somehow try to uh, uh, keep control, which was not a very good uh, plan because what they were trying to do is not give the people their dollars, but instead they give this, those dollars to the government and the government was basically subsidizing everything. 
So maybe if you saw the news in uh, in summer 2021, uh, I think the news reached the entire world is that the people in Lebanon were just uh, lining up in, uh, at, at the gas stations. They cannot uh, get their fuel uh, or anything because basically yeah. the government was uh, subsidizing the fuel. So everything was at the rate of the black market, which was back then like, let's say, 15,000. But the fuel was at the rate of, it started at 1,500, then it uh, rose to 3,900. So imagine yourself, you're a, a fuel, uh, you have a gas station, and the fuel here in Lebanon is sold for, let's say, $1, okay? But you can use that fuel and sell it in Syria for $15. So what was happening is that these fuel, uh, these gas stations, they were not selling uh, people in Lebanon because that's what that was not very uh, profitable. So they were uh, just smuggling all the fuel to Syria, and that caused a lot of, uh, you know, as you saw uh, as you saw in the news, uh, just people lining up for gas, and uh, people can't find gas. So uh, that was another mistake by the government. They just put a price fixation on the fuel, and they subsidized, which they didn't do very well, because they didn't give everyone enough money to, first of all, import the fuel. And when they imported the fuel, they were just exporting it to Syria, because that was... Hmm. All right, so the government tried to counter the rising prices and the hyperinflation via price controls, and of course, uh, shortages were the result. All right. Uh, and that touches on my next question. If you could characterize what is like the actual life like under hyperinflation when you see prices uh, doubling or tripling in the span of one year. If we didn't lose you, I hope so. We cannot hear you, Thomas, so maybe try to rejoin. But you shouldn't be muted. Yeah, try try to rejoin as a speaker. Uh, all right. Uh, could you try rejoining as a speaker, Thomas? I don't see the request. All right, uh, until Thomas rejoins, we've got one request to join in the discussion, Charbel. Hello, hi. Okay, we'll see if this works. Yeah, hi Charbel, if I pronounce it correctly. You are now a speaker, so you can join in the discussion. Hey, just I wanted to say hi. I'm. Uh, I live in Lebanon as well, so. All right. Hi. Yeah. And I know Thomas. Like I don't know him. I only know him on Twitter. So just waiting for him to come back. I can like fill you on with with some information if you want. Yeah. Sure. Oh no, he's uh, back. If you could. So yeah. I don't want to intrude. I'm just like want to to share some stuff while he's he's gone. But it's okay. Right, we need Thomas back as a speaker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. sorry. Hi, uh, Thomas. I'm not sure where I was disconnected. Uh, so, what, what were we? What were we talking about? Yeah, I wanted to um, uh, hear a bit about uh, what's life like under hyperinflation, basically, how people cope with that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So maybe I was talking about the fact that uh, the government was subsidizing everything. So. In 2021 uh, and 2022, basically the prices did not rise as fast as, as the inflation of the lira, because basically the government was subsidizing almost everything. Uh, so you could go to the supermarket and you can find meat and milk and whatever for uh, the price for the old prices uh, at the rate of uh, 1,500 or 3,900. But at the same time, the exchange rate was, the black market rate was at the rate of 15,000 or whatever. But 
this created a problem because uh, you could go to the supermarket and even though the prices are low, but sometimes you cannot find certain products because merchants uh, were, first of all, uh, not very uh, not very sure about the future. So they, they were always aware that maybe the prices will go up. So sometimes they wouldn't even sell. They would keep their products in the storage. Uh, this would cause uh, a lot of shortages. And uh, sometimes they would even smuggle these products because if, you, if you're selling a product in Lebanon for, let's say, $1, and you can instead sell it for $10 in Syria, they would smuggle this product to Syria to sell it there because it's much more profitable. And if you look at the map uh, from Beirut to Syria, it's, a, it's like two or three hours uh, ride. So it's not that, that far away. You can just move all your products and go sell them in Syria. Uh, and this also was uh, applied to the, the gas uh, and fuel shortages. Uh, same, same thing happened. But today, in, uh, in late 2021 and in 2022, um, almost all of the subsidies have, have been lifted. So now if you want to go and fill, fill up your car, you have to pay the actual price of the fuel which is uh, in dollars or in Lebanese pounds at the black market rate. So now, if you're in Lebanon, you can basically just find everything you need. Uh, but the prices are way higher in Lebanese pounds. So unless you have some kind of an income in dollars or in Bitcoin or whatever, uh, basically you cannot, uh, you cannot afford many things. Uh, many, many people in Lebanon, let's say, who used to earn $1,000, that was uh, 1500000 Now $1,500,000 is like uh, around $20 or something like that. So, or even less. So, no, it's even more. Uh, it's like $40 or $30, something like that. So, uh, basically, if you're still earning a, 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 a salary in Lebanese pounds, uh, everything is so much more expensive to you. But if you're on a, a salary or if you're a foreigner or you have a, uh, an income, uh, foreign income, everything is way cheaper. So the way I see it is that in Lebanon, yes, we are experiencing a hyperinflation in the Lebanese pound, but we're actually also experiencing deflation in dollars. Because to me, um, and this, this point speaks about this point, uh, Saifuddin speaks about this point, is that uh, national currencies are nothing but just a translation of the U.S. dollar. So the Lebanese pound is not actually a currency. It's just a, it's just a, it's just paper that that, get, that can that get its value from its U.S. dollar convertibility. So back in the day in Lebanon, let's say you wanted to buy a an apartment, uh, an average apartment in a not not in the capital would go for $100,000 or $200,000. Now you can find the same apartment for $50,000, right? So this, this is what I mean by deflation. Also, gas prices are lower in dollar terms, uh, as well as almost all food, pro food products in the supermarket and uh, all this stuff. And at the same time, uh, all the taxes because they are still denominated in Lebanese pounds at, at the rate of 1,500 or some of them at 3,900, if you uh, calculate them in dollars, they are much cheaper. So uh, the way I see it is that, uh, yeah, some people are still earning in Lebanese pounds, but uh, now if you have like a skill or uh, you're actually a productive member of the economy, and you can earn dollars, uh, everything is much cheaper. Uh, and also that's, that's because of the, the fact that the banks uh, did not, no longer have uh, credit facilities. Yeah, I hope we didn't lose you there again. Uh, but th this is interesting. You basically have uh, like a double currency system in the country. And I was wondering, uh, how is it with like the public sector? 
if like the police and such uh, earn their wages still in Lebanese pounds or if the government pays out or is able to pay out in dollars. Because if they still receive their wage in Lebanese pounds and if they don't get like 200% wage increase, uh, it uh, should be on the brink of collapse, basically, because these people won't be able to afford anything soon. But I guess we lost you again. It's sad to see. Yeah, try to rejoin, please. So this is one uh, one matter that I'm curious about. How is basically the public sector keeping up? And also, if ordinary people are able to get their hands on dollars, like in... Uh, like corner exchanges and such, like not through earnings, but if they can convert their Lebanese pounds into dollars. How accessible are actually the foreign currencies in the country? So I guess we'll discuss that if you're able to rejoin or if anybody would like to chime in, just raise your hand. Yeah, and the reason why I'm mentioning uh, like the public sector is because in other county, countries that experience hyperinflation, we have seen that the state basically dissolves for some time as the government is basically unable to pay proper wages to their employees in the end because the currency basically lose all credibility and all value and the government isn't able to get their hands on foreign currencies. So I'm just curious how how is it in Lebanon? Because this could basically lead to a like a total stateless situation, which could be bad, could be good, depends on <laughs> depends on other matters. It's in, quite interesting, and uh, maybe I would like to speak in the future with someone from Somaliland, which is a which is an area in Somalia, which is basically like a stateless area where things function quite well. All right, Thomas. So maybe now we could get you back. All right, Thomas. Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure why this keeps happening. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. They are uh, disconnecting you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so my question was about the public sector. Like, how does it work? Do they still get their wages in Lebanese pounds? And, like, are they happy about that? Like yeah. the police and the utilities companies and such. Exactly. Um, if, uh, Lebanon has one of the biggest uh, public sectors in the world. Concern, uh, in Lebanon, there's, like, a five million or six million people. And from these people, let's say they have uh, four million in the workforce, or maybe, maybe even three, three million, uh, 300 or more than 300,000 people. And the number is not even accurate because the government doesn't even know, uh, work in the public sector. So these people who work in the public sector, uh, they are still earning uh, their salaries before hyperinflation in Lebanese deal. So let's say you used to work in the public sector for a monthly salary of $1,000, which was 1, 500 before 2019. You're still earning 1, 500, which is uh, 30 or $40. So uh, imagine your, your salary went from $1,000 a month to $40. Uh, a lot of these people are leaving their jobs in the public sector. They're they're going somewhere else. Some of them are, uh, you know, fleeing the country, or some others are, are uh, uh, you know, just working something else at the same time. But uh, there's, a, there's a huge problem now in Lebanon with the army and police uh, because uh, there's something in the Lebanese law that says 
if you're in the police or in the army, you simply cannot quit. So um, you have to you have to do s some complicated procedure to be able to quit. So th there's a lot of army people who are just escaping the army or po even police. They are just escaping. Uh, some of them leaving the country. And when, as a as an army person or a police, if you leave the country, you cannot come back, or else they will just throw you in jail. So there's a and also Lebanon has a big. Uh, a big part of these 300,000 people who work in the public sector are actually just army and police. And uh, many of these people uh, were, were actually not needed in their job. They were just simply um, enrolled in the army or in the police because of, the, of uh, you know, political favors or uh, just to get their votes in the elections uh, or their families' votes in the elections. So you have a huge... Uh, draft in the, in the army that is probably not needed and they're just leaving. Uh, I think the estimated number is like 10,000 people in the army and the police have escaped, escaped their duties. So there's this, this problem and I think uh, mainly it's only this part of the population who, still, who are still working in the public sector. They are the most who, who got hurt by the hyperinflation and by the economic crisis. So um, uh, I think that's, uh, of course, I'm not, I'm not going to sound uh, heartless or whatever, but I think that's uh, the word healing, <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know what I mean? Because a lot of these people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a lot of these people were not productive and uh, they were just, uh, they just got that jo their jobs because of political favors or because, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they were part of a certain... Uh, political, uh, what's it called? Yeah, political movement or whatever. So uh, uh, now uh, with the hyperinflation, many of them, uh, you know, they don't actually deserve uh, a raise. And if, if they get the, the raise, other people who work in the private sector who are actually productive, they will have to pay for it. Uh, and hmm. it's not very wise to print more money to give these people because they will never catch up with inflation. So, uh, yeah, that's that's how it is in the public sector right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I, I would like now to steer the conversation towards uh, Bitcoin in Lebanon. Yeah. So how easy, how easy is it to buy Bitcoin, actually? Yeah, Or so... Acquire Bitcoin, yeah. Yeah. So in, for me in 2017, that was when I first got into Bitcoin. And in Lebanon, uh, the banks or the central bank banned the banks from dealing with exchanges. So if you have a Binance account or a Coin, Coinbase account or whatever, you cannot use that account uh, to link your bank account. So that's, that's off the table. So back in 2017, um, we only had the peer-to-peer -peer market. So the first time I remember I bought Bitcoin, I went to local, localsbitcoin.com, uh, the famous website, which is for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, Bitcoin trading. And back then, there was like only three uh, people listed and buying Bitcoin or selling Bitcoin. So I contacted one of these uh, guys and uh, I did not know him. And that was very sketchy. But, uh, you know, I contacted him and he was very nice and he helped me. And I bought, I bought from him Bitcoin with cash directly. But now after the 2019, uh, you know, economic crisis and everything, uh, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer market exploded because, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's because of the economic crisis, but it, it did explode. Now you have a lot of Telegram uh, groups. But what they do now is that uh, you, you buy from someone USDT on, uh, on the TRC network on Binance. And from the USDT on Binance, you, you can buy Bitcoin. You can also buy Bitcoin directly from the sellers, but uh, it's more common to buy USDT because uh, it's, uh, it's cheaper and faster. And let's say you want to buy 100 bucks of uh, Bitcoin, you just give them $100 and they give you 100 USDT. Or they also take... Uh, certain uh, fees, 2 or 3%. It depends on the market. Sometimes uh, it's negative. 
So now, if uh, if you if you want to buy Bitcoin in Lebanon, if you want to buy um, or any cryptocurrency in that in that matter, uh, it's extremely easy. Uh, there are a lot of groups. There are a lot of uh, people who are de- dedicated to be uh, Bitcoin changers or USD changers. Uh, I have like uh, dozens of uh, contacts. I can now contact them and buy directly Bitcoin or USD from. Uh, or even sell, and the the liquidity is is a huge for uh, such a small market. You can find a million dollars in Bitcoin and sell them sell them peer peer to peer, uh, and that's I think that's good, uh, and that's that's uh, that's uh, like a, like a representation of Bitcoin's anti fragility because uh, if you ban Bitcoin, if you ban the exchanges in Bitcoin, you will have a very good uh, you know, alternative market, peer-to-peer market emerging, and, it, and it's perfect for us because it's non-KYC and you can just directly buy Bitcoin or buy USD or whatever. So now it's uh, it's perfect to buy Bitcoin in Lebanon. There's ab- absolutely no issue. Yeah, I was ju- I was just gonna say that sounds like a pretty healthy market. It's all peer-to-peer, high liquidity, no KYC, very private. That's uh, Actually, much better than the market exactly. in like many like developed countries or Western countries. So that sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. So, so do any merchants accept Bitcoin? Can you buy stuff for Bitcoin, or do you have to first exchange it to, to uh, like cash dollars? Yeah. So, not not to not to my not to many businesses accept Bitcoin. There are a few like. Um, uh, car dealers, or if you if you were like buying huge sums, let's say you're buying a car for like ten thousand uh, dollars, I saw some car dealers who accept Bitcoin or USDT, uh, and some people accept Bitcoin for apartments, uh, and, you know stuff like that, you know, high amount uh, products, but uh, you know in small places, in supermarkets, in uh, restaurants, and uh, no, like right now, no one, no one accepts Bitcoin, and also like the the entire Bitcoin industry or the you know the space or the community of Bitcoin in Lebanon, it's basically not actually Bitcoin. It's more like crypto oriented, where um, most people are in it uh, to trade uh, Bitcoin or trade other cryptocurrencies. There are a few people uh, in the community who are you know understand that the value proposition of bitcoin and the hodling strategy to use bitcoin for savings but it's not as uh, as as much as you would expect considering uh, lebanon is going through an economic crisis and hyperinflation you would think uh, more people would be interested in bitcoin but uh, it's not as much as you would think um, i think uh, you know the adoption the adoption rate uh, of bitcoin did actually i mean the economic crisis did uh, did something good for the adoption of Bitcoin, but uh, it's not uh, as much as you would expect. Uh, it's still very weak, and uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say uh, there is uh, you know true adoption of Bitcoin. It's not like um, what you see in maybe Venezuela or El Salvador. It's more like uh, yeah. a few people. Yeah, I see. So people would still consider the dollar as a store of value, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in Lebanon, even before the crisis, uh, people were, are very accustomed with the dollar. So uh, people understand the dollar. Everyone uh, in the market, merchants and everyone, uh, they they really like the dollar. Uh, and it's used on a daily basis. And even if you want to buy something in the Lebanese dira, it's first priced in dollars, then converted to uh, Lebanese pounds. But uh, yeah, there are a few people uh, who are now into Bitcoin. There's a there's a group that we have uh, like a Telegram channel and uh, it's it's a community. It's called Bitcoin du Liban, and uh, right now I think the group has uh, more than 1,000 people. So I think that's that's good. And these people, this group is mainly focused on Bitcoin only, so it's not uh, crypto oriented or anything. So that's uh, that's a good uh, that's a good uh, thing to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... Are there any like widespread uh, crypto scams going on in Lebanon? Because uh, this is, for example, a huge problem in uh, Nigeria, 
where there's a lot of distrust towards Bitcoin because they had a lot of scams going on. Yeah, uh, there's there's this thing a few months back that happened back in the summer. It's called the Binance Fund. I think uh, also made the news where uh, it's, it's simply like a website that's, that was trying to imitate Binance. Uh, it would promise you if you deposit money there, they would give you like 1% uh, return every day on the money. So it was something completely uh, you know, out of the ordinary. A lot of people fell for this, for this scam. Uh, and it was actually based in Lebanon, the scam. So this website uh, was advertised as a company that's operating in Saudi Arabia or something like that. And, but a lot of people fell for it. And it was actually a Ponzi scheme where you just put your money and it's gone, you know. So, uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, a lot of ongoing scams. Um, I'm sure there are a few, but uh, it's not something that uh, as big as this, because this one, a lot of people actually lost money. I'm not sure what's the actual balance or accumulated balance that was lost in that scam, but uh, it was a huge number back then. Yeah, and uh, like from the other side, are there some high quality Bitcoin resources in Arabic? Because that's like the language, right? In Lebanon, it's Arabic. Yeah, uh, you know, there are some uh, some Bitcoin Arabic contact content. If you go to, I think the web, website is uh, bitcoinarabic.org. Uh, this website basically translates all the good articles that are written in English, translates it to Arabic. Uh, but the thing about Lebanese people is first, they don't like to read. So <laughs> the culture of reading is not, very, is not very apparent here in Lebanon. And also those who like to read are actually people who like to read in English or French. So... Uh, so when we try to send those who are interested, we send them actually the articles in English or, or French or whatever. But uh, yeah, there are uh, some guys uh, who are not from Lebanon uh, working on uh, Bitcoin Arabic content. If you go to that website, uh, you will see many of your, uh, the very familiar articles or even books uh, translated to Arabic, like the Bitcoin standards uh, translated to Arabic, uh, 21 lessons of uh, the book of uh, GG. It's also translated yep. recently, and all of uh, Breedlove's uh, articles are translated to Arabic, and some of uh, Gladstein's articles. Uh, also, I think, uh, uh, what's the guy, what's the name of the guy from Cyprus? Uh, Antonopoulos, some of his oh. uh, work is also translated. So, yeah, uh, there are some content in Arabic, but then again, uh, people don't like to read here, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, is there like a YouTube channel perhaps in Arabic regarding about Bitcoin because that's like quite popular in English as well like I don't think like people like to read that, mu- that much anywhere so we have a lot of podcasts a lot of YouTube content is there anything like that going on uh, there are a lot of uh, content in Arabic uh, but it's more oriented towards crypto and trading so if you go on YouTube, you might see uh, Arabic content which, in which they speak about Bitcoin occasionally. But most of the content is, uh, you know, what the new coin and uh, which one will go to the moon and stuff like that. Um, there is a few uh, videos made by Saif Dean where he speaks in Arabic. So those are good videos uh, where, you know, podcasts or him just speaking in Arabic. Uh, but uh, other than that, I don't think there are many uh, Arabic content. I think there's uh, this uh, uh, Arabic exchange uh, in the Gulf. It's called Rain. Uh, they work on some Arabic content. I'm not sure if it's uh, if, if it's anything uh, widespread or uh, if they have a lot of content. But they 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 are uh, committed to that. Um, and that's pretty much it, I, I guess. Maybe later someone. Uh, and the, and, the, and the audience can give us more content. I think that's it, basically. Yeah, yeah. If anyone in the audience would like to join in, just raise your hands. We are going to pump you up. Oh, here. Uh, this is the. I think Arabic Hadid is here. Uh, he's he's the guy responsible for BitcoinArabic.org. 
uh, he works on a lot of Bitcoin uh, content. Ah, yeah, I can see him. So Arabic Hodl, if you'd like to join us in the discussion, that would be great. But uh, just feel free to decline. All right, but we've got we've got Project Apes up here connecting. All right, you're you're the speaker, Mr. Project. Hey, how you guys doing today? Thank you for having me up. I, I'm very touched by your um, hospitality. Thank you very much for allowing me Thanks. up to speak. I was going to say that um, there is a uh, some some groups that are doing uh, learn to earn here on Twitter, and basically you're learning about the different cryptocurrencies um, that are up and coming. And, um, you're also learning about Bitcoin as well. And, you know, just the whole cryptocurrency ecosphere or ecosystem. So, you know, just a little something to put out there for you guys. You, they're right here on Twitter. Um, I'm involved in it myself. You can DM me, add me. Um, I'll follow you back. Anything you guys need, let me know I'm here. Um, I believe in the old Bitcoin white paper, which is trust, you know. Um... All right. All right. Thank you for that. So um, maybe let's get back to like uh, the economics. And yeah, your writings are influenced by Austrian economics. So I'm curious if you are first influenced by Seyfedin, who is Lebanese, right? Or uh, did you discover like the Austrian School of Economics by yourself independently, Thomas? Yeah, Seyfedin uh, 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 is actually Palestinian, a uh, Palestinian Jordanian, but he used to live in Lebanon, you're right. Uh, but yeah, when I was in university, uh, that's when I met Seyfedin, uh, and he was uh, the one who got me into Bitcoin. And from that, I also got into uh, Austrian economics and, you know, the libertarian ideas and uh, free market ideas and all of the good stuff. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, mostly because I read the, the Bitcoin standard because of the things he, he used to taught, uh, teach us at the university, he got me very much into uh, Austrian economics. And since then, uh, and because of Bitcoin, and uh, uh, it, it fits perfectly with the, this uh, economic thoughts and the school, um, I was pretty much hooked on it. Uh, I started reading Mises and Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hoppe, even De Soto. Uh, and since then, you know, uh, I've been, uh, you know, I, I, I don't claim to be any professional or uh, expert on the school, but uh, I think uh, uh, it, it makes sense because back when I was in university, I did not really like economics. I did not like the mainstream economics um, at all. But when I discovered the, the Austrian school, uh, I thought it was much more logical and it made, it made sense to me. And this uh, actually made me more interested in economics. And now I try to write uh, you know, my thoughts uh, in these articles that I write. So um, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm very grateful for Seyfed Dean for getting me into Bitcoin. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do the same, you know, trying to uh, preach as much as possible uh, to those who, who need it. Yeah, and uh, I forgot to mention you've got your own blog. It's uh, sir slash t. Uh, it's like sir thomas sir slash t dot yeah. medium dot com, uh, where you write basically everything in English, and uh, the overlying theme or the underlying, underlying theme is uh, money, Austrian economics, and uh, some comments on Lebanon. And uh, I actually enjoy your writings because uh, you can basically observe like the Austrian business cycle theory and uh, everything that the Austrian school uh, <clears throat> explains in real life in a quite... Um, like 
hastened or fastened uh, terms because like the business cycle in the western countries it takes like a decade before like you can op- actually observe it but in lebanon it took like uh, two years basically now so that's pretty exciting and uh or like it's not exciting to live in that but uh, to read the analysis <laughs> right uh, yeah yeah and, and you just published uh, an article yesterday uh, about like on the massive concentration of wealth we can see today, where you point out like uh, in a sound economy we should see something like the Pareto distribution of wealth, like, where like the twenty percent or eighty percent of the wealth, let's say. Yeah. But what we actually see right now is like a fraction of one percent owning like almost everything and yeah. uh, you specifically specifically point out blackrock uh, which basically like the largest world's largest asset manager that basically owns everything so how did that happen could you give, give us like a, a a page of this article how did this situation happen that uh, like these huge asset managers basically own everything yeah, so basically the point I'm trying to make in this, make in this article is that uh, interventionist economists and those who, um, you know, uh, subscribe to schools of the Keynesian school and the Marxist school, uh, they always uh, teach us that whenever uh, we have a free market, uh, the wealth gets, uh, you know, uh, Grouped or uh, it gets it gets in one place at the specific, uh, it gets in a, in the one percent. But what I'm trying to argue in this article is that it's the complete opposite. Uh, when you have a free market, you're basically uh, exchanging resources uh, voluntarily. So let's say I have an apple and you have one dollar. I give you the apple because you want an apple, and you give me one dollar because I want a dollar. So in this transaction. We are both winning. We are both. Uh, there's no zero sum game. So this is how the free market works uh, in a simplified way. But when it comes to uh, inter- interventionist uh, way of thinking and interventionist economies, uh, this is not how it happens. And the, what I am trying to argue in this article is that there are a lot of uh, interventionist policies that lead to the concentration of uh, wealth in the 1% or even less. But the most important policy or the most interventionist tool is fiat money, central banking, and uh, interest rates. So basically, uh, you know, what, what, they, what we are taught in the Austrian school is that uh, if you have uh, hard money, if you have uh, you know, f- freedom of choosing money, uh, and if you have you know, free banking and interest rates are set by the market and based on the time preference, uh, this, uh, interest rates and the inflation of money is basically uh, a market sing- signal for entrepreneurs to perform economic calculation. So uh, when this signal is disrupted by the government and by the central bank, where they raise and lower interest, rate, interest rates uh, the way they like, uh, you know, the entrepreneur's signal is uh, disrupted. So you cannot perform c- uh, economic calculation properly. Yeah, and the result is the Cantillon effect, which basically leads to a concentration of wealth under these asset managers who are the closest to the money spigot, basically. Uh, I guess we lost you again, so I'm going to bump up uh, Dave now. Uh, Yeah. And Thomas, please try to rejoin again. But we've got Dave now connecting. Please don't shill any Ape NFTs to us. Hi, Dave. Hello, Thomas. Dave, are you My there? My mic was off. I apologize. Um, yeah. <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> Hi. I guess Thomas isn't with us anymore. Maybe he'll, he'll hopefully rejoin. I wanted to make a comment uh, about his uh, article from March of last year. Uh, he wrote an article called Bitcoin, the only moral money. Um, and it's, uh, it's, is an argument that I've been making, uh, among my circles for a very long time. I'm a, I'm a Catholic, I'm a traditional Catholic. 
Um, and it seems as though in, in the realm of morality, a lot of Catholics have kind of accepted the pure free market, um, neoliberal capitalism. Um, and not a lot of people have given any real serious thought to Bitcoin, uh, it seems in, in Catholic circles. And so I just kind of wanted to get Thomas's, um, feeling on, on that, um, whether or not there are any other like discussions maybe where he's at about uh, the morality of fiat dollars. Um, and then the other question that I had was primarily about um, there's a, a neighbor, a neighboring country of Lebanon that's uh, a little oppressive, I guess. And I'm curious if Bitcoin is uh, going to, I guess, help in that struggle of uh, liberation uh, in that Middle Eastern region? Those were my uh, kind of two questions. Yeah, thank you for that. I guess Thomas will join us shortly. Uh, he just keeps on disconnecting, probably a bad connection. Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> like uh, like I said, there's, a, there's an oppressive country over there that I don't think wants to have conversations like this out on the, uh, the internet. <laughs> yeah, I just believe it's... Uh... It's a bad connection and it's good. He's got the electricity because there are some blackouts happening in Lebanon recently. I know there was there was a couple of um, uh, uprisings or, or something I was seeing a video of um, uh, maybe towards the end of last year, right after the, the, the bomb that went off that it seems like everybody forgot about as well. That giant yeah. mysterious explosion of the uh, the grain silos. Actually, I'd be curious if maybe he even has more information on that because there's uh, pretty much a news blackout here in the states. Yeah, and I just learned today there was actually a second explosion this year where some fuel tanker exploded in Lebanon and it killed like thirty people. And I haven't seen that anywhere. So crazy stuff happening over there. So, Thomas, could you please just try to rejoin as a speaker? All right. Uh, anyway, like, as you mentioned, the morality of the fiat. Uh, I just read uh, a very good article Gosh. by Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas is here. All right. So you can take over, Thomas. Uh, have you heard the questions? Uh, I think I heard Dave was speaking about... Uh... You know, the blackouts? Yeah, that as well. Uh, but the questions were, uh, if you could comment on, like, the morality of fiat. Because you wrote some kind of, some article ah, yeah. in March commenting on the morality of fiat and why Bitcoin actually uh, is the most moral monetary system we could have. Yeah, so this article was based on the a book, uh, Thank God for Bitcoin, which was uh, written by Jimmy Song, and Breedlove, and others. Uh, so basically, I was uh, just making the case of how uh, Bitcoin is honest money, and because of uh, the fact that you cannot uh, take anyone's Bitcoins, because you cannot uh, uh, counterfeit Bitcoin, uh, you cannot... Uh, uh, you basically just own Bitcoin. Uh, it fits, uh, it aligns very well with the idea of morality that comes from, uh, you know, religions. So uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it's wrong to steal and the fact that it's wrong to lie and whatever, all of these uh, moral uh, values um, can, specific, can, can be uh, attained with Bitcoin or achieved with Bitcoin. So uh, this is basically the, the idea of the article. And I even, uh, you know, get some references from the Bible that uh, fits perfectly with, with Bitcoin. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's interesting if uh, anyone's interested in that. Yeah, and the second part of the question was uh, about like the foreign policy, but I didn't quite catch the meaning of that. Uh, anyway, sorry, I couldn't hear your question very well. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure what the question was. Like, um, you probably got some tension with some of your neighbor, but I'm not familiar like with the situation in the area that much. 
Yeah, yeah. You mean like uh, the the situation with uh, with other countries, like Lebanon, with other countries? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the the one of the biggest issues in Lebanon is that if you live in Lebanon, uh, all of your borders are basically closed because uh, Lebanon and uh, Israel are in a state of war, if you want to say, where Israel is considered an enemy. So if you live in Lebanon, you cannot go to Israel. And the uh, same applies to Israeli people. They cannot come to Lebanon. And because of the war in Syria, it's also very hard to cross the Lebanese borders to Syria. Uh, a lot of uh, shady things happen at the border. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an issue as well. So that, that created uh, some problems for Lebanon. Uh, and you're basically just stuck. I mean, if you live uh, in Europe, you can uh, go from uh, France to Germany uh, using a train or whatever. But uh, here in Lebanon, uh, even if you own your car, it's so hard to cross the borders unless you have a certain, uh, certain goal or mission. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the foreign the foreign policy or the, the foreign relationships with Lebanon with other countries is not very well, and that's that's creating even more problems for the economic situation. Yeah, thanks. I'm adding Rai into the discussion. All right. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. We can hear oh, you. Good. Uh, uh, thanks for allowing me to talk here. Uh, Thomas, this question is for you. If you can, you can uh, kind of fill me in on this. I'm also Lebanese, uh, but I live abroad. I live in the UAE, and like most Lebanese, I send money to my family like on a monthly basis. Usually, like on a traditional basis, traditional way. Usually, like through like a Western Union or MoneyGram, this type. My question is basically like, um, is it worthwhile to? I mean, is it easy for somebody to? If I was to send funds, like if I was to send my parents Bitcoin on like a monthly basis, if they choose, if they're not like stacking, if they were like to choose like to cash that Bitcoin in, is it easy for them to do something like that? Um, and is it convenient? Like, is it like, I'm assuming that there's no, like, there's no like exchanges, like legal exchanges, like shops to trade Bitcoin. Um, if you can just kind of fill me in on that. Thank you. All right, it seems we've lost Thomas again. So he'll, he'll rejoin, I guess. All right, so uh, as I was saying, I uh, read a good article today. It's by Alexander Svetsky on Bitcoin Magazine. And let me find how it's called. It's on the homepage. Uh, where is it actually? They just publish so many, so many articles every day. Something like Bitcoin solves the problem of democracy. And he, like, this goes back a little bit to the morality argument where the government basically takes 50% of our earnings via taxation and the rest is being devalued, devalued uh, every year via inflation, uh, which seems quite immoral to me. Uh, yeah, we've got Char Charbel requesting to speak. So while we wait for Thomas to go back, let's hear it from Charbel. Hello again. The other, yeah, hi. hi. Yeah, you were joking before that maybe someone is oppressing Thomas, but the government is not that advanced yet. <laughs> uh, we have we have very bad weather today. That's why when we have bad weather or a storm. Maybe think in the mountains, so the connection is bad. <clears throat> so, uh, what do you want me to do to answer a certain question? Yeah, there was a question from Rai about um, basically <clears throat> remittances over Bitcoin, if I understood con correctly. If yeah, uh, yeah how convenient? Like, yeah. Yeah. So, like Thomas mentioned before, there is there is a peer to peer market here. So, so yeah. So if you can, if you send Bitcoin or your SDT to your parents or to anyone, they can uh, they can cash it out to to you as dollars. 
and i think this is the most uh, the most the the most cheap uh, cheap option to do you know it's cheaper than uh, than western union or cheaper than a uh, wire transfer so let's say if someone has a binance account abroad he can send me uh, usdt with with the 0% commission and i can i can sell the usdt to you as dollars with uh, with 1% or 2% uh, gain so actually i'm gaining money instead of losing this is an idea for example great and I was also curious, since we have you here and uh, you're from Lebanon as well, what does uh, like the education or meetups uh, look like in there? Are there any Bitcoin meetups in Lebanon? I or... didn't. Yeah, maybe maybe there was before Corona and before the crisis. And uh, like I once talked with, uh, with Thomas on Twitter like a year ago, and I told him when there are meetups, let me know. But I don't think there are like uh, explicit or or a real big public meetups for Bitcoiners nowadays. But uh, but before the crisis, I believe Thomas can can answer this question more properly, of course. All right, Thomas probably still has connection problems so i'm inviting weatherman to join us here that seems to be there's some connection problem as well all right we'll we'll uh, have the last round of questions hopefully thomas will be able to answer some of them and then we'll wrap it up Hmm. No, weatherman wasn't able to come up. Thomas, can you try to unmute yourself? Unmuting yourself if you've got the connection. Ah, all right. <laughs> all right. So anyway, as I mentioned, Thomas has very good. Medium account, 30 with a slash, medium.com. He also runs a podcast in Arabic. Uh, you can see the name of the podcast in his Twitter handle. So do check it out. If you speak Arabic, if you don't speak Arabic, check out his blog. And if we don't have any other questions, and Thomas seems to be unable to rejoin us, I guess we'll wrap it up today. Ah, we've got Dushan. Dushan requesting, so let's hear it from Dushan, my dear friend from Slovakia. Hello, guys. Thank you, thank you, Joseph, for uh, connecting me. And I'm really happy that we're speaking about Lebanon and the situation there because I'm uh, I'm really interested in uh, how to help in Lebanon with uh, Bitcoin education, and that's where my question is heading um i want to ask charbel or thomas if it's if it's here uh what would be like the best way i don't know to approach people in in lebanon with bitcoin education if it's via some video um channels or some articles like how how the current situation with education is and what should be the best way to to kind of get Bitcoin to people and uh, help them see how it can help them. So I lost just the last part of your question. So the question was like, how do you see like the education about Bitcoin in Lebanon would be like the most efficient? Uh, what What sources of information um, if, if it's via video channels, YouTube channels, or some uh, some written materials, uh, if, if approaching more the younger generation or older older generation, like what do you see as the 
is the best the most efficient way to get bitcoin to people yeah well uh, the economic crisis in my opinion was the was the best wake up call to shift from the fiat and the banks towards bitcoin and and more individual sovereignty but unfortunately the majority of the people was wasn't uh, didn't take this uh, this choice so like the older people you were t- asking me about the older people they they don't like it at all and uh, even the young uh, very very few of us are are uh, convinced about huddling and switching to to hard money most of us young people want to trade and earn quick money so um, so i don't think uh, more information would help there there should be something else i'm not sure what but uh, but there should be like a different approach yeah i understand the the, the quick money is i think not only a problem in lebanon but i think everywhere that the the young people want to get them as soon as possible and uh, do you see maybe the approach from the vendors or, or merchants do they see this alternative as uh, as a way to go uh, over bitcoin or they don't see it as as their uh, way to choose you mean if the mer- merchants will accept bitcoin yeah if, if they if they yes if they see it as the option um, while the lira is hyperinflating if they would accept bitcoin or they they are just maybe afraid of it yeah the, yeah they're not very interested i think um, thomas uh, talked about it earlier uh, the they prefer to stick with the dollar mm-hmm. which which they know better which also like the, now the majority of the people trust the dollar and they, we don't trust the, the Lebanese lira um but i think it helps if if there will there will be more marketing like yeah, uh, more uh, banners talking yeah go ahead thomas sorry Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, I can. I think I can answer your first question, uh, Dusan, uh, regarding like how we can make Bitcoin more widespread in a country like Lebanon. Uh, for for people to be interested in Lebanon, regardless of the uh, for people to be interested in Bitcoin, regardless if you have a hyperinflation or not, uh, Bitcoin needs to perform, needs to go up in price. So that's how I see it. Classic NGU. <laughs> yeah, that attracts the most people. That's that's true. All right, uh, we've we've lost Thomas again. Yeah, I need, I need to yeah. apologize. Yeah, I need to apologize on behalf of all Lebanon because <laughs> we have really bad weather today, and it seems the the wireless connections are are not handling the situation. Yeah, no problem. So, that's totally out of your control. So no problem. Yeah. I'm just glad uh, you could join. Thomas could join. So thank you all for listening today. And pitch me some interesting guests for the next time. I would be curious about talking to someone from Turkey because Turkey seems to be on the similar path to Lebanon. I hope it won't go that way, but They've got like a 35% inflation in December, which seems pretty crazy. So if you know some Bitcoiner who would like to join in from Turkey, just let me know. And I guess this is it for today. Thank you, Thomas, if you're still able to listen to that. If not, I'll send you my thanks over DM. Thank you, Charbel. Thanks for all the listeners for joining us today the recording will be on our youtube channel shortly thank you have a good night or a good day if you're in a different time zone and i hope you i hope to see you here next time goodbye thank you bye bye bye